I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. There are stories of people who go missing in the forest all the time, especially in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. What I never expected, though, was for it to happen to either myself or my best friend Peter during our yearly summer PCT hike. Here's my story of my friend Peter, who is still missing today, and I'm telling you, it was Bigfoot. It took him. Before I tell you what happened and why it was Bigfoot that took my friend, let me tell you about why we track the PCT every year in the first place. And by the way, I don't go in the woods at all anymore, ever. While I still have a love for the forest, what is in it is enough to keep me away from it. Like I said, this is a yearly trek for Peter and I, taken seven times since we both graduated from high school. Even through our college years, we took the trip. He was my best friend, and I missed the guy. We both grew up around Seattle, Washington, went to school together, played baseball together, and our families were close as well. So close, in fact, sometimes the family camping trip was planned out by Pete's family most summers. So yes, we were great friends, brothers more like it. Those camping trips grew into a passion for the both of us of the outdoors in general, from fishing to hiking and on to hunting and even rock climbing or bouldering or anything that had to do with the outdoors. We loved it. It was our graduation gift to hike the Pacific Trail for the first time from one side of Washington to the other. We got the okay from our parents and a ton of hiking equipment as a graduation gift. They must have spent a pretty penny too, because everything we needed was there, plus a couple of gift certificates to REI for future use. So, with everything you need for a through hike, we were off to start building a huge passion for hiking the PCT. Our eighth hike would be through Oregon. We would start around Mount Ashland area where the PCT cuts through and follow that to where it ends at the Bridge of the Gods. We would also stay the night there to get some fishing in before Peter's dad would come and pick us up. We both worked for ourselves. I had become a photographer and Peter, he was actually a disc jockey. However, he was a good one who was starting to get some notoriety at the time from a couple of labels and some pretty popular annual and regional venues. July was our month that year, and we were set to go. We cleared the calendar of everything for this trip. We flew to Medford International Airport. From there, we would have an old friend from Seattle, now teaching at Southern Oregon University, pick us up and drop us off near Mount Ashland in the Pacific Trail. From there, we started. From where we started, we could see the mountains and Pilot Rock, a volcanic plug that is visible for miles just east of the I-5 north of the California-Oregon border. The weather for the first next few weeks was expected to be decent, but there were no guarantees. It was the Pacific Northwest. The weather is rather unpredictable here. So we brought weatherized gear and clothing as well. We had a GPS with us, a map of the trail in Oregon in general. Plus, we carried one cell phone that would only be turned on in case of emergency or checking in. This would be a literal 30-day hike. We wanted to relish it all, and I wanted to get some stunning pictures of the land and some night photography, too. I only brought one camera, three lenses, cleaning kit, three small extra batteries, and a super lightweight tripod I could strap on my backpack. We were ready to take the first step on a perfectly gorgeous 82-degree day in southern Oregon for 30 days. To get nearly 500 miles, we'd need to hike at least 15 to 16 miles a day. That was easy. We were still young in mind and body. The first week was great and rather uneventful, minus a couple of blisters that were forming on my left foot. But I brought a little something for that, and it seemed to get better, or at least not worse as we traveled on. Passing Mount McLaughlin was a bit tedious for the first part of the hike, but it was still not until we were to hit the Willamette National Forest around Mount Bachelor. Well, about 40 or 50 miles south of that, we started to see and hear things weird. Weird things started to happen. I'll tell you this, we've both been in and out in the middle of nowhere many times, and we've both heard things in Washington State that were just off. I've heard tree knocks in the middle of the day and night, and both of us, near Mount St. Helens, heard what sounded like a scream, a human scream, about four years ago on a camping trip. Bigfoot had been a discussion, and for Peter, well, he was a little more skeptical about the existence of such a monster of the woods than I was, even up to the week of his disappearance. I had a healthier belief, I think, in Bigfoot than Peter. 
I need to at least be careful while hiking or just out enjoying the outdoors. I erred on the side of safety where Peter, well, he just erred sometimes. I hate to say that about my best friend, but it's a reason for him being gone today. Back to the hiking trip. We had made it past Watchman Peak where we would hang out and would take some awesome night sky pictures over Crater Lake. And by the time we hit Mount Wilson, we were feeling a little rugged. Tired, I guess you could say. We were moving a little too fast and covering an extra three to five miles a day by the time we were headed into the Willamette National Forest. So we decided to take an extra day there to recoup and then get back on the trail. 48 hours later, we were right back at it. Two days later, we were up around Waldo Lake area when that night, while relaxing by the fire, we started hearing tree knocks. It would not stop for almost two days. That's where the madness started. Raining rocks and tree knocks. There was a little drizzle that first evening when the trip would turn into a nightmare. So we sat under a tarp. We tied two ends to a tree. That would be our makeshift tent that night. And we sat there talking about the last half of the trip. We heard three knocks. It was close enough to grab our attention. I mean real close, like within 20 to 30 yards to the west of our tarp lean-to. See, the reason I decided that I'm open-minded about the existence of Sasquatch is the fact that only people or something with arms and hands can pick up a stick or a small log and whack it against a tree. Apes and chimps do it. They have arms and hands. A few minutes later, rocks came flying in, landed on the tarp, and rolled off the back. I leaned back to grab one. It was a small rock, about the size of a super ball you would play with as a kid. It was not rubber, though. It was the lava-type rock that was all over the place. I looked at Peter, and he insisted on yelling into the dark at some hikers, who were most likely playing jokes. No answer came, just more knocks. Then two more rocks would land near our fire pit. Peter still thought it was hikers nearby, just messing with us, that didn't know the rules of hiking the PCT and how to treat people along the way. Eventually, he laid down and turned in for the night. I, too, turned in for the night as well. I woke up at 3 a.m. The fire was almost out, so I tossed another log or two on and went back to lay down. That's when I heard some movement, 15 yards away or so, in the dark, just past the light of the fire. The movement turned into walking, bipedal steps, they were heavy. I swear I could hear huffing-type sounds as well. I sat there next to Peter, but didn't bother him for another minute or so. Well, I didn't have to wake him after all. The walking continued, and I could tell that it was on two legs, and the sound of footfall was close enough to know that it was someone tall, or heavy, or both. I mean, I could almost feel the steps on the ground. Like when someone is running through the house, you could just feel it. It circled around two times around the outside of the camp, just on the edge of the darkness, out of the light of the fire. On its third time around, it stopped about halfway, somewhere I thought to be near the trail itself. That's when the large snap and the crash of a tree woke Peter up, and I mean straight up out of his sleeping bag. He settled down quickly, but he was asking me what in the world was that. I told him what I'd been hearing for the last 15 minutes, and then the tree snapping crashing to the ground. Peter reached inside his bag for a flashlight and started shining it down the trail southward to the opposite direction we were headed in. No movement could be heard, but at the edge of the light, you could see a small pine tree now blocking the trail that was not there earlier. My friend was my friend to the end, but even we would disagree from time to time. He started telling me I was hearing a black bear that possibly could have had cubs nearby and was trying to warn us to get us out of there. I didn't agree, and I told him about the sound of walking around the camp. He wouldn't buy it. He figured the bear was just walking. This was just not true. They may look like it when it comes to track or footprints, but bears do not walk around bipedally. After a while of quiet, Peter crashed for the rest of the night. I finally fell asleep, but not without my mind wondering what in the world this was all about. Were we being followed or hunted? Have you ever felt like you were being watched? So much so that you actually got that tingling feeling up your spine and the chicken skin or goosebumps that seemed to never go away? Well, me too. And that's what I was feeling all day the next day. After we ate breakfast, Peter and I headed out for the next 12 and a half miles that day. Tree knocks could be heard, and I swear I could see movement from time to time to the west through the trees, 
as if we were being shadowed through the forest the whole day. If it were not for the tree knocks, I don't think Peter would have noticed anything, but he did. By lunchtime, he mentioned he had noticed movement to the west here and there as well. However, Peter was more excited about the prospect of a mysterious thing following us all of a sudden, whereas I was starting to feel really uneasy. Lunchtime brought more tree knocks and more movement from the west of the trail. Whatever it was, was just staying far enough to be almost all but completely hidden. It was not until the evening that things got more serious and Peter became more interested. By that point, I think Peter had a feeling it was more than a bear, and most likely not human, at least. Either way, Peter started a long conversation that lasted five miles, and through setting up our next campsite, about the idea and concept of and about Bigfoot. As for me, I felt things shift from being shadowed to being hunted. I mentioned it to Peter, but he being who he is, well, he figured if it was by chance it was a Bigfoot, it was simply most likely just curious about us and just following us because of that curiosity. That chill up my spine never left, and I told him just before nightfall that we should at least call someone to let them know what was going on. We've been checking in by text every other day anyways. Peter agreed and texted his mom and dad and new girlfriend, of course, where we were via GPS, and a short message that we were being shadowed by a small black bear, and not to worry, that we'll get rid of it if we had to by scaring it off. The last part was for his mother to keep her from worrying. The wood knocks still came from time to time, not as frequent as the night before or during the day. However, during the time we were making foil dinners over the fire, Peter could hear the bipedal walking, the weird heavy footsteps, and that I'm being watched feeling was back this time. A kind of fear came with it. I felt as though I was really being hunted, for real. I started telling Peter that maybe we should just make a real quick call, hunker down for the night, and leave in the morning, and I meant calling the trip over. Peter would have none of it, stubborn he was, in through most of his life to tell you the truth. At that moment came the whoops, from less than 50 yards away we could tell. I almost wish it would have stuck to the knocks, because now that Peter heard it too, he was really excited about the potential Bigfoot we might be encountering. His talk became almost low whispers, and he began to tell me about some of the stories and encounters he read over the years about these creatures. None of them really sounded all that good, so I had no idea why he was so excited, and his sudden interest and belief freaked me out. About half hour after dinner, I had had enough of the wood knocks, whoops, and heavy-footed creatures just past the edges of the light and the dark force of Oregon. I was heading out in the morning. I told Peter how I felt, my plans, when we were to hit the next junction, which brought us within a mile before a service station. Peter, of course, argued with me, but, being a great friend, understood how I was feeling and sent the text at that moment. I could not sleep, and for a while I was actually feeling better knowing I was out of there in the morning, even when the whoops and tree knocks that persisted through the night. Morning had broken, as fast as morning broke, so did I for the trail. We had about 10 miles to walk to get to the Forest Service Station cutoff, and my dad was already heading down to pick me up by late this evening. The knocks persisted, and the whoops were stepped up to a couple an hour almost by whatever that thing was hunting us. I really believed it was hunting us. There were moments when we would stop for a few, and Peter caught the glimpse of something tall, like a huge dark shadow moving through the trees about 40 to 50 yards away to the east of the trail. And while his interest was piqued again, I was getting more and more excited about leaving the situation. I kept telling Peter to come with me to get out of there. He would have nothing to do with the idea. As a matter of fact, he wanted to borrow my camera and record the sounds and try to get a picture. I said yes, but I also pleaded again with him. It was late afternoon when I reached the cutoff to the ranger station. I was a little scared about walking off by myself but with the bear spray in my hand, I knew I could at least slow an attack from anything, and that stuff is really powerful. Mostly, I was afraid for Peter. Maybe he would be okay. This thing had yet to step out into view. And no more rocks had been thrown, but the noises became more frequent through the night and through the day, as well as the wood knocks and the fact Peter saw something. It was simply time to go. I said goodbye, and I told him I would see him in a week at the Bridge of the Gods. The real report, I would never see Peter again. 
The report, the official one, reads like any other missing persons report that goes missing along the PCT or any other part of the Cascade Mountain Range each year. Possible animal attack or mistake made by hiker while on a hike. No, that's not what happened. First off, my camera was found, as well as all the camping stuff, intact, except for the camera was missing the memory card and the cards I gave him. That's a fact. I know there were sounds recorded on there. I recorded some before I headed to the station that day. They say that he must have left the trail and headed east that day, so he did make it another night out there. His camp was found nearly 13 miles north of the station, nearing the upper part of the Willamette National Forest. The camp was clean, as if he just got up and went for a walk. Personally, I believe he did, and I believe he took the camera. The scratches and nicks on it told me so. They were not there before. I also think he ran smack into Bigfoot, and I believe what others know to be true, that we are food out there, and not just from mountain lions and some types of bears, but a giant man-like creature as well. I know what I heard, and the tall dark thing walking around us, circling us, was not a bear. It was walking. You could hear it for a fact, and Peter saw it. I miss Peter. He was my best friend, my brother. His curiosity is what got the best of him, not the other way around. And if you think the Forest Service has no idea about these things, well, they do. And I can tell you that the lead agent was not telling us everything, and my memory cards were never recovered. Everything but memory cards and Peter were found intact. Everything. Today, I'm a street photographer. I contribute to a small gallery in Seattle, Washington, and I also do weddings at special occasions, as well as portfolios. As far as the wilderness is concerned, it's a backdrop, a background in my pictures today, way off in the distance of my subjects. I no longer head out too far into the wilderness today. I stay close to the city. I do go to the beaches for scenic pictures, but even that sometimes is a little uncomfortable. I know what took my friend. It was Bigfoot. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. If you enjoyed today's video, here's one you don't want to miss. Also, if you have a story you'd like to share on this channel, email me, lynnsmith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com. I hope to hear from you soon.